Hello everyone. My name is Jordan Farmer. This is the Uncommon Ground. Sorry, this is the Uncommon Conversations podcast, episode 24. And today my guest is a, a very well-known TikToker, your pal Austin. He, uh, a lot of his content is actually political or topical, or at least addressing a lot of the things that we deal with on a day-to-day basis. And so <clears throat> I invited him on. Uh, I'll get more into uh, how that all happened once he gets on. Here we go. Hello, sir. What's up? What's up, man? How you, how doing? you doing? I'm good, I'm doing, man. <laughs> I'm doing good, too. I'm doing good, too. I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, so I'll just uh, briefly explain to everyone, including you, how I came across your content. At first, I didn't piece these together at first, so I actually sort of discovered you twice. Okay. Um, one of them was the pronouns video. Like, yeah. this dude didn't know what pronouns was. I was like, first off, very well done. I love your music. I love your style. I, I like a lot of heavy metal stuff, so it's not necessarily my, my go-to, you know, music. But I, I like a wide range of stuff, and so I like I like what you've done there. And so I like the, the little video musically. It was very well done. I, I like the sound, and it's very catchy. You're open And mind. then, randomly in the live on TikTok, I randomly popped through your thing, and you were just sort of talking about, um, I don't know what the issue was, because I've listened to a couple since then, and you, you hit a lot of different topics pretty quickly. So um, I think it was <clears throat> um, vaccines, and then wow. more recently it was conspiracy theories today. You were talking about that. And so I thought, that, you know, that would be really interesting to talk to you. I thought, you know, you, we don't necessarily place, I wouldn't say we, we would situate ourselves in the same place politically but i think we can agree on a whole lot so there's it'll be a i think an engaging and a, a, a nice conversation so i wanted to have you on and here you are i really appreciate it man i think it's cool that you know not everyone that has a following is still willing to sort of give it back to anyone who doesn't necessarily have a following or they don't want to chase you know le- uh, lesser followers you know they're kind of picky about it and so the fact that you're doing this you know mad respect to you i really appreciate that I, I'm in the same game. You know, I have a podcast of my own and I'm constantly asking people who have a bigger audience than me if they want to come on my podcast. And so it's like, I, I, you know, and I'm always really, really grateful when they say yes, you know, cause it's a, it's a big part of trying to grow a show or grow a podcast is like that cross pollination of audiences and being like, cool. If this person who like, usually it'll be like a person who's got like a couple million followers on Instagram, like shares one of my videos or something. And then I like message them. I'm like, Hi, I'm glad you liked that video. Would you like to come on my podcast? And like, sometimes they don't respond, but it's always yeah. nice when they, when they say sure, you know, and, and, yeah. and they, I think a lot of people understand that, that like, there's not really any difference between people who have a, a thousand followers and people who have a hundred thousand followers and people who have a million followers. Like, it's just kind of like, is it's time. Yeah. Did you, how much time have you put into it? Is this what you're doing? Is this like your career yeah. or, you know, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think I definitely, I definitely know once I started doing this steady and I've been doing at least three podcasts a week, there was one time where I had two dropouts so the numbers dropped slightly, but I've been doing three podcasts a week for a few months now and I'm wow. getting it heavy. Um, I have, I've been, so I, I got into politics, I'm 27 now. I got into politics when I was 17. And so I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time. So it's years and years of sitting in. Uh, I was a car detailer and a warehouse worker and security guard. So just sitting there thinking about stuff a lot. And then, you know, it, it sort of come out well. And I definitely am not going to. I like how certain people like Jordan Peterson have done seasons for their podcast. So I'm going to hit it heavy to a degree. But when I feel like it's not what it should be especially because the name, you know, I'm being ambitious here, Uncommon Conversations. The If the fire isn't there and, you know, it's not not happening, I, I think calling it off for a period of time might be something to do. But I'm, I'm far away from that. That's just some something that I've been sort of thinking about myself. But <clears throat> um, when you are going like that and you show, like, you are doing the work and you are putting it in there, it makes it a little easier for other people to want to help you because they know, it might amount to something because because they're going to keep going and building their own stuff and as both audiences grow you do get that that cross pollination and the more exposures you get to people the more sides of them you see you know you might find a hook a different way 
Yeah, it's interesting. It's like, you know, like your friends and family are definitely going to be like cheering you on and definitely going to be like, I hope it works out for you. But they can't really do much in terms of like actually growing your audience for you because it's also they're like too close to it. So, so for years, I was making content that literally just my friends and family were seeing. And every once in a while, someone would like, we'd like be out to lunch or something. And it'd be like, hey, I, I think you make funny videos, man. And I'd be like, oh, thank you. And they'd be like, I like what you do. And they're like, you should keep doing it. And I'd be like, okay, th I'm going to keep trying. But I did it for years and years and years just to, to nobody. The only thing that really like helps grow an audience is when people who don't know you, who like what you do, get a hold of your work and they start sharing it with more people who don't know you. It's easier to grow amongst people who like, you, you become more of like a personality and like, a, like an abstract idea of a, of a person. But yeah. for people who, who went to high school with you or who you grew up with or you know like friends like they're obviously going to want you to be successful but like it's weird when someone sends you something and they're like hey look this is my cousin like you should watch this like someone sends me that i'm like i'm good yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. Really care. it's not not likely you're yeah. gonna click on it but if it's your political buddy on instagram sends you this thing you're very like oh okay like yeah, if they're just kind of like you, check out this credibility yeah just like check out this person check out this podcast i listen to you know and it's like i just found this guy i like them you know i found this person now imagine if your content yeah. was political how much that would be amplified right yeah like yeah. like the people that you're going to be i mean well actually i shouldn't even say that your your content is political you do actually touch on those issues so i was sort of i wasn't thinking thoroughly enough there before saying that but um so i'm sure you've experienced that a little bit where there's there's tension and also when you're going to talk about politics in public, it's a lot easier even to deal with the haters. But if you have a really uncomfortable conversation with someone in your life related to that, it's definitely, you know, it's going to, it's going to, well, you know, it's like be it, a different it, level of an issue. It's absolutely, I mean, I, I get a lot of people who are trying to help out um, content creators who have a bigger audience than me who will say, like, you should lay off the political stuff. Like, you should, you would, you would do better. Cause like I do, I do a lot of just like silly sketches too. I just do a lot of like comedy and like comedic videos that have nothing to do with politics. And people will be like, you should just do that stuff. You would grow faster because you would be, your, your content would be less divisive. You would, you wouldn't be pissing as many people off. And I'm kind of like, yeah, I, and I can see it. I can see the validity of what they're saying. I just personally feel like to me, part of, the, the, the responsibility of having an audience and having a platform is like, well, I, I feel like I should speak up on things that I think are important. I also feel, and I say this a lot on my platform and on my, my podcast, uh, that like, personally, I think a lot of my stances and opinions on things aren't political. Like I view them as just like, oh, I think this, this is something that is that people should care about because I think it's important to everyone. I don't really care which political party is backing it. Like I, I don't really think a whole lot about like, how can I help out the democratic party or how can I help out? Like, I, I, I don't really, I think care that, about, yeah, I think but, there's a lot of people that are silently really like that. Even if they are like, yeah. you've got to pull the trigger one way or the other. Right. Especially in 2016 and 2020, uh, it was only amplified, and I, 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 when I was talking to people, and I made a video. I talked about this before. In 2016, it was very much a lesser of two evils election, not a I really, really like this person election. And it, we've been going in this direction more and more. Back a in like elections, yeah, back, in, back in the JFK Reagan days, you know, and ignoring the people in between. You okay? You could say great American presidents. They had the presence. They had the look. You can have criticisms, but I'm saying like they, yeah. they at least. There was a, cer a certain something there, a certain uh, respectability or prestige that is gone. <laughs> I think what's interesting, though, I talked about this just barely on a live that I just got done doing on my TikTok channel. Uh, we tend to mythologize things a little bit in the scope of history. So we look back and go, now there was a president. Now JFK, mm -hmm. that was a president. But if you were actually alive then, there was just as much contention and strife over that election as there was any other one. Like there was just as much, like there were people who like did, I mean, we, we, we look at Ronald Reagan and people, you know, he's the great communicator, the fall of the Berlin wall, all this stuff. There's a lot of people who were alive then who go like, Oh no, that guy was a terrible president. And there were people who were alive when it was happening, who it was a contentious um, election. And I think we look back on things and we sort of mythologize them and be like, well, that now that was, that was a president. But I, what I was talking about on my podcast was how, you know, 9-11 
uh, the anniversary just happened. Yesterday was 20 years since 9-11. And you, I saw a lot of posts on social media of people being like, I wish we could have responded to the pandemic the way we responded to 9-11. We really came together. We really all got, and I was like, mm. well, did we? Like, I think we're looking back at that with a little bit of rose colored glasses. And I think that in reality, there was a lot of division on what actually happened. There were people who were truthers who were like, no, this was a government false flag operation. There were people who were pro going into war. There were people who were very anti-war. There were people who were responding um, very harshly to the Islamic community. And there were people who were like, hey, that's really racist and xenophobic and like, don't do that. And I, I don't think that it was just this thing where we all were like, we all know what to do and we're all on the same side. I think we look back and go, we really came together. And in ways, in the early days of the pandemic, we did that. In the, we can look, I think in 20 years, we'll look back at the pandemic and go, you know, it was cool that people like kind of showed up to help each other. Like people were cheering in the streets for healthcare workers and healthcare workers were working overtime. And, you know, and I think we'll look back at the, the heroics of the event and see it as a time when we sort of came together and we'll sort of blur out the, the division. Um, but I think, you know, does that make sense that we can? No, sort of, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we yeah. have these brief moments where it's all about where your attention is. It's all about your perspective. We have these brief moments where we have these flashes of, oh, we're a country. <laughs> yeah. You know, with 9-11. Yeah. Oh, we're a country. Or yeah. it, with COVID-19. Oh, we're human beings who can get this germ. Like yeah. there's this reframing of the perspective that is really healthy. And I wish people could stick with it longer. But then when you get into back into politics and how we actually implement all this stuff, all those divisions are right. still, the real divisions will still be there within those, those Democrat Republican frames and the limited conversations that we have, um, which is yeah, largely yeah. listening Sorry. to the crazies on each side and reacting to the crazies on each side. Because <laughs> oh, they're yeah. like the, the loudest, the most fervorous, and also like, when you're too nervous to say something and then the one dude who will go way beyond the line will at least go get out there and say it, then you can be like, well, no, but, you know, you, it gives you that, that um, what's yeah, the term, the, the window, was that type of window? Oh, geez, I don't know. The, like, perspective window or the, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's like there's a certain window of things that you can you can discuss. I can never remember the, uh, the specific term for that. I feel I feel... Terrible, oh, but. I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I, yeah, but anyway, I yeah, there's, yeah. there's certain acceptable common discourse and there's over the line conspiracy theories. And even within that frame of conspiracy theories, I like like on your TikTok, I saw you talk about there's healthy skepticism and unhealthy skepticism. And it's like you should still follow and trust in some sort of logic and line of thinking. You can't just like kind of blank it out or like yeah. give out on any sort of like uh and yeah, you common, can't just give up on anything and any sort of uh, facts or data. You still have to have reason to come to some conclusion. Otherwise, it's kind of dumb to, to come to yeah, that common, conclusion. A common argument that you see right now is people who say, like, you know, blind obedience in any form is bad. And people shouldn't just exercise blind obedience to anything. And I think that that's a little bit of a straw man argument. I don't think that anyone's actually arguing for blind obedience. I think what's, what's trying that – what people are trying to have occur in the discourse right now is – informed obedience if you want to call it obedience i don't even want to call it obedience i want to call it like informed participation that it's like we want you to participate in the measures that we're trying to take to expediate the process of getting us through this pandemic and we're going to try to give you give you the necessary information to 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 get your participation and i think that when it's just like blind obedience i think that there's this idea that people are just sort of doing what they're told like uh, my, you know, my, my elected officials told me to do this and I just do what they say. I don't think that that's an accurate representation of what's actually going on. I think it's a misrepresentation of the argument. I think that the argument that people, I think what people want to see happen is, well, we want you to listen to healthcare professionals and, and, and doctors and scientists and not just cherry picked ones. Like you can go find a guy with a PhD who says, Hey, I got a PhD. And I don't think that this, that, that this really adds up. But like, no, go talk to like doctors and nurses who have been working in the ICU specifically with COVID patients and ask them, what's your experience been over the eight, last 18 months? And you don't have to personally ask them. Like you can like go watch their content or go, you know, and like inform, try to like, try to, but you know, it's, it's, 
it is hard to for for people to feel like they're adequately informing themselves when there's so many different sources telling you so many different things um we, we, we need to have better sense making uh that what we, we what we've realized with this pandemic more than anything is that our sense making has been broken politically and it was overlapped with a pandemic where it was made political in both ways reactions to things like the hydroxychloroquine discussion was tainted by trump generally speaking like there was not yeah. a nuanced what did the study say it was but, either it's the secret sauce or it's going to kill you like that was the that was the reaction and it was one or the other and there's and there's many other like layers of nuance so like you absolutely touched on sort of the one two jab of this discussion where it's like where it's um it's about like what are the professionals saying what do you know what are we dealing with is this a real problem and then also like we should be taking measures to solve it but then there's a question of like what measures are we allowed to have access to are there people that are manipulating like the idea that the vaccine is the only answer and that um any alternatives are bad is m being manipulated into the narrative like the horse dewormer stuff yeah like that's straight up anti corporate corporate in, uh yeah. sorry big pharma like uh those are articles designed to service big pharma and their special interests and to make it so that the vaccine which pays a lot more than ivermectin is going to be used instead of the other one when there were some studies as early as may of last year saying that ivermectin is like 80 percent um effective as a uh, uh a preventative i don't know what the the specific term is it's a uh, another word yeah. that always eludes me but uh prophylactic i actually yeah. got that one it works mm -hmm. as a prophylactic so there's there's issues of the discussion being confined because of politics and because of corporate interests like i believe the news is real i believe journalists do a real thing but i also know that certain journalistic journalistic outlets are corporate media which yeah. means that they're going to be and they're owned by the same people that we say manipulate the politicians and manipulate the world but we're like but when it hits the news it's like oh well now they're the sacred cow of journalism we can't actually look at who owns these journalistic outlets what could be like if you own Pfizer stock and you run an article like that, you can see there's a conflict of interest. Like, I, I absolutely yeah. believe in investigating the Koch brothers, but I also mm -hmm. absolutely believe in investigating George Soros because they're both rich people manipulating the system, and that is the problem. It is yeah, not so left-right conspiracy theories because there's, there's almost a weird echoing between those two guys where mm -hmm. it's like the Koch brothers and the Soros, and it's like sometimes, like, Soros just came out against China and talking about warning people against investing in China because there's some questions about, you know, how out of control they're going to get. And that's an area where I'm like, okay, cool. We're acknowledging that there's a new horizon of concerns with the government of China. You know, we're, we're yeah. acknowledging this in a way we didn't before. And he's a guy who's previously been very cozy to that. So that's like a great example of, it's like these guys are, again, myth, myth, the mythology around them is yeah. created but it's really a lot more straightforward like the whole narrative and the conspiracy behind covid isn't that there isn't the virus it's just that at every other stage in the reaction to the virus we've been played the information was slow rolled out of china we were all locked down a bunch of small businesses were arbitrarily told to shut down and people's lives were destroyed and like you can like you can live off of unemployment but you cannot rebuild a business off of unemployment if we had some sort of a program to say if you had a business on march 1st of 2020 we'll give you a loan to get you back where you were that would be like a much more direct way to try to handle this and i'm all i'd be all for that i don't mind the extra spending because if uh the government broke it the government should you know buy it so to speak like yeah if, if, if it was some external force or your business just goes under that's on you but if it's because of what the government's doing then you can say you know there's a a cause for this sort of extra step yeah, so that, there's a lot there um, uh, to, to unpack. Um, uh, and I think what you're, the, the general gist of it is what you're saying is that throughout this entire thing, there's just been uh, a lot of different narratives and conflicting narratives that have created the circumstances for people to feel distrustful of, of where this information is coming from uh, on both sides. And I, that's, that's kind of what I'm hearing there. Just a couple things. Um, uh, 
that I heard that I just want to address. Uh, so this study that was done, um, and it is one study that was done that showed that ivermectin could be a, 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 a good prophylactic for um, treating COVID-19 and preventing COVID-19. Uh, this, there's, it's this one study that everyone's citing, and you know it's this one study because everyone uses the same language that was used in this study. This study was done with a sample size of 72 people. When it was reviewed by uh, the CDC and the World Health, Health Organization and by uh, medical professionals across the world and virologists across the world, they all unanimously found that the data was not high quality because it didn't use high quality um, traditional scientific methods and, and, and large enough sample sizes. And they, but they were willing to look into it, to ivermectin as a potential um, treatment. And so far, all of the high quality data that's been coming out of uh, lots of different studies from different hospitals in different countries and different uh, individual doctors and virologists and epidemiologists is that there is no high quality data suggesting that there is a link between ivermectin and um, treating COVID-19. And, but there's so this it's, one so study. So it's a question mark. So it's a question right. mark. It's not. It's, it's, it's uh, like. Well, there's if there's no one... data supporting it, that doesn't mean there's no data yeah. dismissing it. But, but, right? but, but what everyone's quoting is this one bad study. So you, well, you mentioned. Well, also, well, there's I, a guy who went second, on the Rogan podcast. One second, one second, one second. No, 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 one second. Yeah. So yeah. You, you said that um, if there's someone that is um, promoting the vaccine and they've got stock in the vaccine, we should be wary of that. The people who did this low quality study on ivermectin own stock in ivermectin. Like that was who produced this. So like by your own logic, like the people who produced this study and, and everyone thinks that there's lots of studies that were done. It's one study that everyone's quoting, that everyone's sharing and thinking it's a trump card. It was done by people who own stock in ivermectin. It was uh, checked by people who don't own stock in ivermectin and found to be a low quality, unreliable study. And so like, you're right that we do. So what I'm seeing in this situation is a breakdown in critical thinking is people are, there are a lot of different information sources feeding us a lot of different narratives. And you are right that it is good to be skeptical about, well, whose pocket is this person in? I wouldn't trust Greg Soros as far as I can throw him. People like that who, who are big string pullers. I'm more prone to be like, let me talk to my doctor friend who is my personal friend who's been working on the front lines of this thing and say, what do you think? Like, what, what's, what's your takeaway having been on the front lines and having treated people with this disease? And, and, and talk to those people and have those people go, my experience is it's for real. My experience is mask working works. My wearing works. My experience is that the overwhelming pe amount of people who are coming into our hospitals right now are unvaccinated people. And so I, I feel like there are ways to critically think your way through the conflicting narratives that are coming in. You're right. There are lots of different streams of, of narratives coming in. Who's pulling the strings? Who's got vested interests in which studies? All of that stuff is good to look into. But you have to be willing to push through that stuff and go, okay, but like, what's actually going on? Besides the fact of who wants to sell which medication? Or I mean, first of all, vi vaccines are free, so I don't know who's making money off of them. And if you talk to doctors who are administering vaccines, they're like, we don't make any money off of those. Like the hospital doesn't make any money. We get them, like it is done as an act of public service. Like we, we're not making money off of them. So, you know, I, I think that there are ways to, I mean, with what you just said, that it's like, well, if someone owns stock in this in Pfizer, then why would I trust them? Well, why would you trust someone who owns stock in ivermectin, who produced a low quality study with bad data, you know? So, so there was a, so I, so that I did hear that mentioned by, uh, I think it was specifically Brett Weinstein, but separate from that. And uh, I just watched a clip. I didn't watch the full podcast because um, the clips were released in limited fashion from the Joe Rogan podcast. But there's a guy who is a part of a team that's been treating COVID-19 and been trying to develop best practices of all sorts. Uh, and there's many different, like there's many different medical, uh, not schools in the sense of like economic schools of thought, but there's many different centers of knowledge. The Chinese have their own, had their own yeah. white paper at the beginning. The Europeans had their own white paper. So there's, there's different sort of uh, schools. And that guy said that there was a uh, evidence within, within his practice of, of that happening. Now, the only doctor that I know of that's been on the front lines has basically had the same messaging the entire time and was extremely political beforehand. So I personally can't, cannot say that I would like 
go to that particular person for that perspective, uh, which is unfortunate because that's like yeah. the only person that I could go to and that, that particular source. But the main thing is like, so I, um, I'm not anti-vaccine. Uh, mm-hmm. I am anti-forcing vaccines and I am anti not letting people work if they don't get a vaccine because fundamentally like we, the discussion around vaccines and it's, I might, I hope I'm not coming off offensive here. There is a sense of I'm really doing a service to other people by getting this vaccine. And I, and it, that's how it was messaged, but it protects you and it does not protect you from transmission and actually people that have already had the, and so this is like a, a side note, people that already have uh, gotten COVID-19 have like uh, six to 13 times uh, better immunity. It was a study out of um, Israel, better immunity uh, against the disease than the original. And from the beginning, I was like, we should test people to see if they've already had it before giving them a vaccine because it's a waste of a vaccine. We could get it to more people more quickly. And so yeah. that from the jump ma- made my, it's for the money, oogie boogie spider sense come off. Cause I'm like, this seems like such an obvious thing if it's about actually helping people with experts who have you know more intelligence than me more expertise than me and i thought of that in like five seconds so the fact that it wasn't rolled out that way tells me that that was not the fundamental intention of that program and the way it was rolled out which is not to say that the vaccine doesn't provide anything um but it is to say that they are forcing it for the sake of money and and you talked about it's free to you but taxpayers are paying it and also people are getting paid for it. So the stock, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines have at least doubled or tripled since May of last year. Um, because you knew if there's five or six businesses in that race to, to create it, to get the contract, anyone that wanted to make money off of that, um, I did not. You could say that's because I'm stupid or because I have integrity. I don't want to dis- <laughs> get into all that. Yeah. It's mostly stupidity, I think. But um, people will make money off of that. And absolute. And so here's the thing. When you have lockdowns and all sorts of healthcare services are shut down artificially, the only way you can get money in certain areas was treating COVID patients. And then now as you're releasing it, they do pay people to cover COVID. There are some incentives to um, not, I mean, not like they do get paid, like people are getting paid jobs and, and like are getting paid their salaries and everything to administer this. It is providing jobs in certain ways. So there, there are people with a vested interest in, in, in this and that are financially benefiting. But the thing is, like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a capitalist for two reasons. One, I believe, like, everyone should have healthy ambition, and that is not something that we should poison with greed or any of these other sort of higher-order concerns. Like, until you have some money, don't worry about being greedy with your money. Like... You know, maybe when you're a millionaire, worry about, you know, your internal greed and materialism and all that bullshit. But like until then, just go get yours, man. Do your best you can. Like that that should be that. I think that's healthy and important. And also every system of capital is capitalism. So anywhere there's money, there's so like you have centralized capitalism, like in communism, where it's absolutely controlled. And you have decentralized capitalism, like in Singapore and certain Nordic countries where they're super economically free. So like it's. It's a, it's a false distinction. What we're talking about is redistributive programs and whether or not there's a role for government to sort of take care of people regardless of, of, of capitalist in the, in the way people think of it, capitalist concerns. And that's the discussion, you know, we need to have. I see um, like the universal healthcare movement as an outgrowth of valuing life. Um, quality of life as well as life itself, saving the life and all that. Like you should not, your life should not be lost for the sake of material lacking. That is the, the essential, the essential idea. And that, that is an outgrowth. And that, like, why is war bad, right? Because life is valuable. We need to preserve life. I think that. So it's it's that's an interesting take. Not a lot of people would say there's a relationship between valuing well, those, life and and that. But I think it's it's a self evident kind of a connection. Those are the kind of ideas that you know. That's what I mean when when people say that I'm I'm political with my content. I'm like I don't really think of it as politics. I'm not pro universal health care because I want to own conservatives or because I want to like, like dunk on Republicans. I'm pro conservative or, or pro universal health care because 
of, of the reasons you just said. I don't think that people should die because they can't afford to, to the treatment for whatever it is that they have. And, and I, I feel like we are failing to take care of basic needs of our society. And, uh, and we're looking at things like access to medicine as like a luxury as like a luxurious right that you should only be able to have if you can like work hard enough and earn enough capital as um the economy is like not keeping up with inflation like like minimum wage is not keeping up with the inflation of prices and stuff like that so like so nothing's equal to the way it was 20 30 40 50 60 years ago it's not like you can easily afford a good health care plan on a uh, minimum wage salary. You used to be able to do that. You used to be able to buy a house with that and you can't do that anymore. And so we are letting people down with this sort of like massive uh, over engorging of the, the 1%. I want to go back a, just a little bit. So I, I agree with you about um, uh, what you're saying about capitalism and, and universal health care. I just want to go back a little bit um, uh, to just talking about vaccines and, and choice and should people be forced to get a vaccine. I agree that no one should be held down and forced medicine. Um, and again, I feel like that's a little bit of a misrepresentation of, of an argument that I see is people talking about like, well, I don't want anyone to be forced to take it. I don't want that either. I want people to uh, be informed and make an informed decision to go and get it uh, based on the overwhelming data that comes out. And so people will say stuff like, well, what, what does that have to do with anyone else? Like if, if I'm just as likely to transmit the virus with or without the vaccine, first of all, the CDC has released reports that show that, uh, you are 11 times less likely to contract and transmit the virus with the vaccine than you are without a vaccine. So there's that. But second of all, even if, let's say that people who are vaccinated are just as likely to get the, get the virus and, and transmit it as people without the vaccine. Um, what we do know empirically from the data that's coming out is you are significantly less likely to, uh, and there's no debate on this, everyone agrees on this, you are significantly less likely to experience severe illness or hospitalization or death with a vaccination. And so people will say, well, so who cares? So you can go get it so that you can protect yourself and not wind up in the hospital. Why don't you just let me do what I want to do? Because again, I'm trying to protect the goddamn hospital workers who will have to deal with you. The fact that like, the, the pandemic can't reasonably end. We can't move on with our lives until we can. The sound, your, yeah, your sound yeah. went off for a second, no worries. Sorry. Um, until we can get back to regular, um, like, loads of in, patient loads in hospitals. So, like, there are people right now who have cancer, who have who are having heart conditions, heart attacks and stuff, who can't get treated and who can't get a hospital bed because we're overrun with sick people from COVID-19. So even if you think, well, the, the vaccine doesn't stop your chances of transmitting or, or contracting the virus, we would actually be okay to move forward if we had a population full of people who are getting a, a, a strain of the coronavirus, be it Delta or the original strain or some new strain, but they were just getting mild symptoms and getting a cold just like any other cold, just like a flu or something like that. The problem of the pandemic is the sheer volume of people who are becoming so intensely ill and needing ventilators and needing to take up uh, space in hospitals and taking space away from other people who have other issues. We can't move forward as a society from this pandemic until we have enough people who aren't getting that sick from this thing. So when people still say like, what business is it, is it of yours? It's like, no, you not getting it means that you might be one of these people who takes a hospital bed away from someone who needs one. And we need more people to not be taking hospital beds away from people. Also, we have data that shows that you are less likely to contract and transmit if you're vaccinated. So even that report that came out from Israel said that you have about, you're about 40% protected from transmission if you have a vaccine. And people went, oh, see, so they don't work. 40% is still not 0%. It's still more than people who yeah, are vaccinated. I don't, I don't like that. It's, so, a, it's a really, it's a, a great example of no nuance where it's like, right. if a mask isn't 100%, right. like the only way a mask is 100% effective is if you can't breathe. Right. <laughs> like yeah, that's the only way all particles are absolutely right. not making it out. Well, so like, they, they so like, they're like well, it's this. only 70%, so it doesn't actually work at all. But, they but, show diagrams but, of this, of like how it works, that droplets when you're talking or sneezing, will come out like a like if you spray a spray bottle 
And when you have a mask on, droplets will still get through, but it's like significantly less. Well, just, there's a, there's an interesting other side to that, and that's that the experts assume proper use of equipment. And the reality is like the cloth masks are absolutely useless and reusing masks without cleaning them in between and lots of other issues have other health consequences and might not necessarily like, I think that there's um, like, like you said, it does help, but you, you got to make sure you're doing it correctly yeah, uh, in order to like, cause we've seen mask use implemented, yeah. but we haven't seen masks or I'm saying we haven't seen the virus go away. Um, and also there well, was, there was sort of the summer of there was a weird moment where we were just where we were deciding whether or not the virus propagates outdoors because there was mm -hmm. this idea of like stay at home stay inside and like if you're outdoors you can't do anything but then mm -hmm. with george floyd we had massive protests and sort of the science caught up yeah. and uh and like i'm not saying that in, in a cynical way i'm just saying the timeliness of it and the fact that it was maybe only in response to this new phenomenon that they had to then engage with. Like the question didn't come up. Well, you know, like it doesn't have to be nefarious, but there I'll, was I'll, that I'll, issue of like that nuance didn't you, come up until this happened. I'll, and we saw I'll a huge you. increase in the virus, in the, the virus, especially in young people after those protests. So that, that like you can weigh yeah. the seriousness of the issues, but like to me, like there, there was, there's weird areas where politics overrides these things in well, both, in you, both ends. I'll tell you, I, I was at several protests uh, in the wake of George, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And A, everyone was masked, like at the protests that I went to, like masks were very popular at those protests. So it wasn't like suddenly, suddenly it wasn't a big deal. B, everyone was aware of the risk we were taking. Like we were going out knowing that like we might get sick. And it was sort of this moment where people- So you're allowed like, to take risk? Well, yeah. I'm, I mean, I don't, people, I'm sorry, I'm being a smart no, ass no, for a second. I'll no, let you but, finish your point. That was, that was, but- Yeah, you know. for something that feels- socially important it feels like you know what this is bigger like this is an important moment this is an important thing to support it's not like we're just going to a concert like we're just like going out and partying like we're going out because we feel like there's something really important in society that we want to address and that felt like a risk that we were like you know what this risk feels like something that's sort of righteous like a righteous risk something that we feel like and and you're right uh cases spiked and those those events were super spreader events so in a way like when you're saying, I guess the, the science caught up. No, the science was the same. Like people got sick from going to those rallies and people, so the science was proven right. Uh, but, but also, yeah, the overwhelming amount of people at those rallies were people who were wearing masks, who were doing their best to social distance while being at them. I was at several and it was very clear that people were trying to keep a safe distance as much as possible, but knowing that like, yeah, we are taking a little bit of a risk here in the name of showing up for this other thing that's also, because just because there's a global pandemic going on doesn't mean that institutional racism stops existing. Doesn't mean that like mm -hmm. police brutality stops existing. We, we can't really, there's certain issues that we can't like take a break from. We can't take a break from, from climate change being a thing. We can't take a, a break from confronting uh, institutional discrimination. I think there's a big difference between someone taking a risk by going to party for, for spring break in Key West and someone taking a risk to show up to like protest institutional racism. I think that there's, to me personally, I think there's a very big difference between those two yeah. things. Well, and, and then there's a third category of showing up to your work and providing a living for your family. Yeah, and right. I, so, so and, you talked about so. that thing too, people who, um, yeah, I wanted to address this too. People who shouldn't be uh, barred from their job because of their choice to not be vaccinated. Now. This is a very interesting thing, especially for healthcare workers and stuff. It's like you are in a field where your job is to take care of the health of other people and to consider the health of other people and to be to to prioritize the health of other people. And you're making a choice to not take a safety precaution. To, it's 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 almost like if you were a person who worked at a hospital and you were an, an assistant in an ER and you refuse to wear PPE. You were just like, I don't feel comfortable wearing gloves. I don't feel comfortable wearing a full suit. It feels very restrictive. It feels like you guys are like forcing me into a situation that I'm not comfortable. I feel like I should, I, I have the know-how. I know how to assist in an, in an operation. And I feel like I should be allowed in that room without the full gear on. And they're like, well, sorry, you're not. You're gonna lose your job if you don't do this. And then you cry oppression. There are many jobs that have requirements of you. I mean, I, I worked at restaurants for 10 years. Like we had to wash our hands 
15 times a shift every single time I worked. We had to wear gloves when we did certain activities. We had to like, like, the, 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 like there, are, there are health and safety protocols at lots of different jobs. It's not a new thing. And I, it, it's like a, a person just saying like, well, how come I can't show up to my job uh, shit face drunk, blackout drunk, like that's my choice. There are consequences. If your employer says these are the, the health and safety guidelines at this job, these are what you have to adhere to in order to remain employed here. It's not tyranny to say, oh, follow these rules or risk losing employment. That's very regular. That's a really normal thing. And I think people are kind of dressing it up as this new thing. This well, that's a vol that is under the guise of a voluntary system. And we the pushback here is against the government showing up and saying you can't employ this person if they don't do X, because then you're robbing up both the employer and the employee of the choice. You are asking them to take a risk in getting the vaccine. Like there is a risk. No matter how small you want it, to, you want yeah, to say every, it is. There is every a risk. Single, every single and state has a department like, of health that comes in and does regular checks at restaurants. And if you're not up to snuff, your restaurant can get closed down by the government, and people can lose their jobs. If a if a health work a, a department of health worker comes to the restaurant I'm working at and sees that I'm doing something that violates code, I can lose my job on the spot. And that's been the case forever. It's and and I could say I have a choice to behave however yeah. I want at my job. They have, so I, I disagree with how that yeah. is done. I think there's a different uh, way to do it that would be much, both much more effective and yeah. um, much more free. Here's the issue. Like, if, you, if a government agency has the right to shut a business down, then hypothetically they could do that accidentally. And then that, that coercion, that coercion sure. sorry, that force is yeah. then used towards some end. So if I'm the competitor, I pay the inspector to go check them out. Totally. You know, now you have this this disproportionate power. The alternative system I would be in favor of is so for restaurants, you have basically this uh, legal requirement. And so, like, we are intruding on the practices of businesses. Um, it's about sort of weighing the trade offs. And it's like, you know, your um, you have the freedom to provide whatever quality or price food you want, unless yeah. it hits the threshold of costing a life or costing, you know, uh, quality of life or something because then it's m something of much more value being weighed against that inconvenience yeah um so i can see that um, i would say that this situation fits that criteria perfectly especially for healthcare workers that it's like you could potentially get someone killed at this job where we're trying to save lives because of this personal choice you want to make and that's fine but we we reserve the right to say you can't work here anymore if that's going to be how you want to proceed. And I don't really see a valid argument to say that's oppression or tyranny. I think that like a, a, an employer has the right to say, we believe that your choice is endangering the health and safety of not only your coworkers, but of the people who come here for our services. And because of that, yeah. we're going to terminate your employment. I think that yeah, that's, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and then if, and then again, so there's, there's counterbalances and stuff. If the employees didn't want that, they could strike and say, screw you, we're not going to do it. Totally. But if the government shows up and says you can't do business, now no one has a choice, no one has freedom. And so like, so yes, it's not tyranny if it's Amazon, it is tyranny if it's Joe Biden. And Joe Biden's done it, Amazon hasn't. So one of these is an issue, one of these is not. Like, I, I, like yes, your point is true. But we're like, you have to react to the news. Mm -hmm. Like, if we're dealing with a real life situation, you can't say, well, but in this other situation, blah, 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 blah. Like yeah. it, it like, not that it's not a valid point, but again, like the, the issue is we are dealing with the reality of this mandate coming out. Luckily there's businesses pushing back. Luckily there's questions of constitutionality and hopefully it'll be stopped because I think it's an overstep. And I think, I don't know, I don't know why. Well, so, I, so what's I the, think what's, it's because the, it's in service of this? the interest that would benefit from forcing more people to get the vaccine again, still yeah. not knowing if they've already had. So here's the thing. If you already have gotten COVID, your risk of getting COVID is gone. Or at least it's less than even if you got the vaccine. Not right? Gone. Yeah. It's well, less than if you got the vaccine. No, that's not. Okay. That's, that's what the Israeli good. study said. You that's are you have better protection said. against the virus. Yeah. If you've got it naturally and recovered than if you just get the vaccine. So if you're in that position and you're being forced to take the vaccine, you're being forced to take not only an unnecessary risk, but one that is going to marginally, marginally benefit you. And again, the, this program is now being rolled out at this stage with that major flaw still being there because it's about money. 
It's not about helping people. Like I'm all for saving lives and helping people. But if, if in the name of science and all these things we agree on, I'm going to be a cuckold for a big corporation and just, I'm cool with that. I mean, you can choose that, but that's, that's, that's again. So this is, you have to understand we're coming into the situation with context. Mm -hmm. We know corporations do this. We know Pfizer has a history of paying, having payouts and lawsuits and issues with their stuff before. So like, the conspiracy theory term applies to the people that think George Bush, George Bush sacrificed small goats on the back of the White House lawn. <laughs> yeah. And there's a rich, elite, isolated, cartel-like force that negotiates in backdoor deals to yeah. manipulate world events to get rich. And they're all pedophiles. That's also yeah. a conspiracy theory. It's the same term yeah. that applies to that full range of, of ideas. So I don't like... So, so I try to avoid... Avoid that. Now, that doesn't mean, like, again, if I look into the study you mentioned back in May, and it was a small study and the data was bad, um, I'm willing to say, hey, then that's good. We need to see if there's more data. You said there, again, you said there was not data to support it. I'd like to see yeah. if there's data, data to say it doesn't work. Like, we just need better and data. And there's especially not data. And I think it's also, that... oh, this is an important point. I think it's, um, what's the term? When, uh, when drugs can be made by anybody. I'm yeah. trying to think of, uh, of the thing. There's like, you know, name brand and then generic. Yeah. Um, ivermectin has been a generically available drug for a long time. So it's not yeah. necessarily one institution that is going to benefit from it specifically that could manipulate the rest of us to benefit them exclusively. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and specifically too, in this instance, like what there's really not data to support is that taking livestock grade ivermectin paste is good for you, which is what was happening. Uh, and a lot of people were saying, ah, that's not happening. So one happening. of those stories was retracted. The, the either USA Today or Vanity Fair, one of the two. I can't remember yeah, which. There, it there, might not even were, be those. That's, yeah, I'm but going, my reports, memory's not that good. There were reports coming out from poison control in, in red states, like several red states saying, like, we are getting flooded with calls of people who are killing themselves on horse paste and eating horse paste and we're, we're running out at our tractor supply stores and stuff like that. Like it wasn't just like a handful that's stupid. of people. Like we can agree yeah. that's stupid, yeah. but yeah. like, like um, yeah. maybe yeah. this is, this is a broad, a broader point And I, I don't, I don't want to like get, I don't want to suck away from the point you just made mm -hmm. with this broader point, but um, it's a dangerous game to play the politics of the stupid, meaning we're always reacting to the dumbest people in the game. Because there yeah. are smarter people with better views and more nuance, and so um, I think lately, though, I haven't. You I, still I, have I, to be wary of stupid people because they yeah. will do stupid yeah. things. But I, this, again, that's a broader point. I think we need yeah. to need to be able to say, um, yeah, need to be able to approach it differently. I've had some friends on the right um, bring bring that criticism to me that they said like it seems like you're responding to the dumbest people, like to like the the most extreme, the stupidest people. And they're like, and you're, you're, you're not really responding to like the smart people who are more in the middle or more like nuanced, like you're responding, you know, and I've had people say that to me and I'm like, and my response to that is like, I understand where the point comes from, but I also think that it's dangerous to write those people off as insignificant and to just say like, ah, they're just a bunch of crackpots. Like, don't worry about them. Those people tip the scales in elections and those people are are creating the narratives that give rise to the more nuanced view of the narrative. So maybe the more crazy person is eating horse paste, but the more intelligent person goes, I'm not gonna eat horse paste, but I am gonna look into this study that was done on this anti-parasitic. And they're gonna look into it and they're gonna see that there was a study done that suggested that it could be a good prophylactic. And they're gonna go, oh, well, you know what? That's interesting that this is getting kind of suppressed in the mainstream media. And they're gonna think that they have a more nuanced take on it, but it comes from this more extreme, like, like stupid crew. And, uh, and also just, you know, the plain fact that so often I also think like, man, if, if so many people on, on my political side, on my team were doing stuff that was that stupid, I would have to like really consider my position. I, it's kind of like um, when Ben Shapiro and those guys constantly get lumped in with white supremacists and Ben Shapiro will be like, but I have a yarmulke on. Like, I can't be a white supremacist. And it's like, yeah, but Ben, then why do so many white supremacists cite you 
when they like do white supremacist things, like when people go and shoot up a mosque and they go, I really like Ben Shapiro. And he's like, that's nothing to do with me. I didn't do that. And it's like, yeah, but, but like Ben, just the fact that so many white supremacists are fans of yours, you might not be a white supremacist in, in, in your heart. You might think that you're a pretty reasonable guy. But if so many people who are fans of yours are getting from what you're saying that like they need to go shoot up a mosque, that should cause some internal introspection and go, what, what about what I'm saying is ringing to them as, oh, I should be a white supremacist, even if that's not your position. So I think that saying, eh, don't worry about these insignificant nut jobs is a little bit dismissive of the more detrimental aspects of your political ideology. Like if you are teamed up with people who are doing awful, atrocious things, if your political ideology is constantly being accused of being racist, misogynistic, homophobic, transphobic, and you go, yeah, but that's not me. That's just the nut jobs. I'd still go, yeah, but you're still in the club. Like you're still like in the club with these people. Like, and you're still sort of like utilizing the same ideas, but just in a more nuanced way. Don't you think that there's some alarms being rung that you're like, boy, a lot of my teammates are really shitty, stupid people. And I know that there are there are extreme people on the left that have extreme ideas, but I don't see people like going to the level of eating horse paste, you know? And, 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 uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I just think it's, I think it's, I don't think that it's, it's necessarily beneficial to just say, toss out the crazies. They're insignificant. I think that it's important to look at the people who are the more extreme people in your group and go, is there some of that in me? Do I have some of that going on? Am I also indulging in some of this, like, you know, like, some, like, I don't know. So I, I, so I really like, you know, I commend you, man. I 100% agree with everything that you just said. Um, and I just think it applies by in a bipartisan fashion. Absolutely. Like, I think that, that the, there are, so like, yeah, the left is a hyper compassionate left. That's pretty straightforwardly the center moral virtue or sort of goal of, of left-wing politics. It's very much compassion first, the harm yeah. principle first. Yeah. And, um, and so <clears throat> it's difficult to say that that will ever look as ugly or as dangerous as, um, you know, me first, uh, me racist, first. Fascist, America first. you know, yeah. racist, fascist, uh, yeah. horse dewormer, uh, straight, you know, free basers, <laughs> you know, like yeah, that, yeah. like that. But, uh, Andy, no, who's a, a, a so there's three there's three layers to this, but I'll just present it in the first layer. Andy, no, is a journalist, an Asian American journalist um, who um, was attacked and beaten by Antifa, and it wasn't really covered by anyone other than people in this sort of tight knit Fox News circle, um, uh, because it's like as soon as you say Fox News, a bunch of people are like, oh, bullshit, nonsense, yeah, like that. That's their immediate, and it's like. They're talking for 24 hours a day. Something's going to be factual in that. Like, <laughs> you know, something's going to be that be, the people are not listening because they're mindless yeah. drones with nothing, with no thoughts in their heads. That's not that's well, too and, easy of, a, of an answer to just dis, dismiss and, people like and, and Fox Tifa business, gets blamed, you know, and Tifa gets blamed for a lot of things on Fox News, though. And Tifa got blamed for the January 6th insurrection. And so I, 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 whenever well, so, someone well, so here, Antifa, I wanted to I wanted to get to that, like Antifa. You have Antifa, then you have the people that are actually right-wing extremists pretending to be Antifa, creating extra yeah. harm in their name. Yeah. Um, and then you have issues like COINTELPRO and known programs by the FBI and the intelligence agencies where they go and they pretend to be these people, create havoc in order to create a narrative and to further divide. In my opinion, this is my step, further divide us and keep us from having a nuanced discussion. Like, we can say Antifa beating the crap out of a journalist is bad. Or, who, again, it's like the name. Whoever is in those black clothes that was there beating Andy No is not an okay person. And all, by all accounts, they had yeah, left-wing mm -hmm. leanings. So, like, yeah, they're not eating horse tea warmer, but they're not, you know, innocent either. We're all human. We all have, like, here's the thing. I believe in there's Papa Bear energy, which is, like, aggressive pure aggressive men are just purely aggressive. And then there's mama bear energy where it's in the name of protecting someone, I'm gonna fuck you up. And that yeah. is the left. 
when yeah. it's the when it's the person who's the bully, when it's the person that I'm protecting the other person from, go fuck yourself. I hate you. You're yeah. worthless. That is just, absolutely a yeah, quick. Was, so it's like understanding and inclusiveness and compassion, unless you're Donald Trump. <laughs> well, it's like I, yeah, it's like I was thinking about because. Um, because I, I think you're right that, that the left typically, the, the central, I, I think that's a really good way of describing it, that like the central um, premise of the belief set is like uh, hyper compassion and like what can I do to take care of the community and take care and like how people taking care of each other instead of a central tenet of the right being like me and my family first and you worry about you and yours and I'm going to take care of me and mine. And, you know, I think you're right with that description. Um, but, and I, because of that, um, I remember when Richard Spencer got punched in the face and I remember watching that clip and it creates a guttural reaction in me that my, my response is like, Oh, don't do that. Don't like punch a guy in the face. Who's just like doing an interview. Like, I don't care what, like, and I have this reaction of like, don't punch him. Like he, he wasn't even looking like you sucker punched him. And then I have to stop and be like, who did they punch? They punched a literal Nazi like they punched a guy who wants us to ethnically cleanse America so that it can be a mm. homeland for white people and so I so have to like kind of go you can't okay, expect yourself like, to feel as yeah. bad <laughs> right it's like it's like I know I I don't like watching someone get punched but if that person is a person who is advocating that America should be a white homeland and should be ethnically cleansed mm. yeah maybe you need to get sucker punched by someone who isn't me because I I couldn't I can't punch people, but, but you know, like I, I can I do think, it. <laughs> I, yeah, I think there's, I think there's a difference between, um, you know, uh, a person like, like, here's an interesting thing. Like the footage from the January 6th, uh, uh, Capitol riot and the footage <laughs> that you typically see coming out of, um, Black Lives Matter protests and stuff like that. It was compared a lot when January 6th happened, people on the right were going, well, look at this footage of you guys setting cars on fire, flipping things over, breaking windows. Why is this any better? Um, now, as a person who's participated in these uh, um, protests a lot, and there have been studies done on this, that they are overwhelmingly peaceful demonstrations. And usually it's outside agitators that show up and, and pick fights. And I'll, oftentimes it's the police showing up and instigating violence and instigating violence on nonviolent protesters. So you have like the difference between a video of a person who's like standing with their hands up and getting hit by batons by police officers who are spraying them with mace and they've just got their hands up and a person who's trying to get into the Capitol and they're choking a cop in riot gear who's pushing them back and they've got their hands around that guy's neck and they're like pushing his eyes in with their thumbs. Those images strike me as different. They're both images of violence occurring at a protest or a riot. But in one instance, I see protesters who are instigating uh, and bringing the violence and police officers who are like terrified and afraid for their lives. And the other instance, I see the exact opposite. I see protesters who are hands in the air asking for the cops to stop. And yeah, eventually some people will go, fine, fuck this. I'm going to throw a brick at you. I'm going to throw a brick at your windshield because I'm sick. Of, I, we, we're standing here with our hands in the air. And usually when those people do that, everyone turns at them and goes, don't stop. But again, like, I think that, yes, violence can occur on both sides of the political spectrum. I feel like motivation for violence does play a role in how we weigh what the moral value of that violence is, uh, which sure. is a weird thing to say, because I would also just prefer that no one ever punch anyone. And yeah. No one ever. But it's like, but it's like, yeah. So like the, this is an oversimplification, but like an, an anarcho-capitalist central tenet is like the use of force is, is immoral, but, um, and there, and there's often, you know, right wing sort of libertarian discussions about that. And I, and I, I subscribe to that. I'm not coming at it from a, from yeah. a negative outside perspective, but, um, Nope, it's gone. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I don't know. I, um, going, um, keep saying what you're saying. I think that this is. I just think this is a, a fascinating discussion. I don't. I don't often get to talk to people in this way who we don't see eye to eye on everything. And I actually, I really thank you for like the conversation. I, I, I respect you for like having the conversation in a very like patient and civil way. And like, I, it's nice to suss these ideas out. Clearly, seeing that we're coming from 
different perspectives with similar data and figuring out if we can kind of like understand where the other person's coming from, I think is important. And it's difficult and it's uncomfortable. And I think it's, it's, it's not meant to be comfortable. So I commend you for being willing to be uncomfortable a little bit with me in this conversation. And I think that if, obviously this kind of stuff doesn't happen in comment sections and it just can't, like there's just not yeah. room for nuance in comment sections. Um, I'm the but, guy who will put three pages on a Facebook comment, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah. And even yeah. that you can't do it, man. Even that, like, yeah. you can be as nuanced as you want in text and people will still like not They'll know what time. your intent is, where your heart is. So we're They'll, five seconds yeah. away from the one hour limit on Instagram live. So you want to hop back on?